So now I will talk about price discrimination in monopoly uh, and, and the consequences of that. So let me open up the document first. Uh, Okay, screen sharing. Um, okay, so uh, there are many kind of different notions of price discrimination and they're kind of silly names <laughs> which have been handed on to us. Uh, so first I'll talk about price discrimination of the first degree, which is price discrimination across consumers. So it's a situation where the monopolist can charge different prices from different people, right? Um, now, uh, there are examples of that, right? For your textbooks, for example, you know, JL and Rennie, if you want to buy the North American edition, that's much more expensive, but they have an Indian edition, which is cheaper. And the idea is that, you know, Indian consumers, Indian buyers on average are more price conscious. Uh, American buyers have, have uh, more money to pay. Um, so they're created different prices. Uh, one problem with charging different prices to different consumers is what? Arbitrage. There's arbitrage, right? So, so Potentially, you could buy the Indian edition and sell it to American students um, at a profit, right? You, you, you make a profit and the American student gets a discount. Now that may or may not be feasible. It's certainly not feasible for certain kinds of things. Um, like what? Arbitrage is impossible for certain products. Services like haircuts and services. You can't arbitrage services. I can't go and get a haircut at a cheap student rate and then turn around and sell it to somebody else. Um, yes. So it, it depends, right? Uh, the other problem. So so one problem with trying to price discriminate is potential arbitrage. The other problem is knowing who to charge how much, right? What is the willingness to pay of different consumers? That's not um, the kind of information which is written on their faces or uh, or in their uh, credit reports. Yes. Um, sometimes companies, sellers can make a crude approximation. So they know that on average, uh, Indian buyers are poorer than American buyers and therefore more price conscious. But that's not true of every Indian buyer or every American buyer. right? They're affluent Indians and they're poor Americans. Um, so let's set that aside and let's see theoretically if price discrimination was possible, what would be the consequence, right? So we'll set aside both these issues, potential arbitrage, as well as finding out the willingness to pay of different consumers. Suppose the seller has somehow solved those problems. The seller has figured out uh, how much each consumer is willing to pay. Um, let's think of a unit demand model, which is different from what we've been talking so far, but you know, think of a consumer good like a microwave oven or a fridge, right? Most people will buy just one, right? Either not buy it or buy one, right? Or a washing machine, you don't need 10 of them. Uh, if, if you're willing to pay, you can you'll buy one, not more than that. So each consumer buys zero or one unit in, in this little model that I'm setting up. Uh, let's say there's a continuum of consumers and um, um, right? So there's a continuum of consumers of measure one. Yes. Um, each consumer is willing to pay some V to buy this, right? That's their maximum willingness to pay. But 
among these various consumers, V is not the same. There's heterogeneity. Some people have low V, some people have high V, right? And uh, let's assume that uh, V follows some sort of something like a probability distribution, right? Or a population distribution. So, and that's captured in this uh, kind of a distribution function F of V. This is exactly like a statistical probability distribution function, right? So capital F of V captures uh, how many people have a willingness to pay, uh, which is V or less. Right. So if you put V equal to 100, for example, right? So F of V tells you how many, what measure of consumers or what fraction of consumers uh, have a willingness to pay, which is not more than 100. Yes. Um, of course, if you take V towards infinity, F of V will become one. And if you take V towards zero, F of uh, V will become uh, zero. And suppose the monopolist is a mind reader who can, every person who walks into the store to buy a washing machine, the monopolist can, you know, have a mind reading gun or something and can read what their individual V is, okay? And therefore the monopolist has no reason to charge each consumer less than her personal V, right? You're willing to pay up to 100 rupees, you walk into the store, they'll charge you 100. I'm willing to pay 50 rupees, I walk in, they'll charge me 50 and so on. Now, the only question for the monopolist then is uh, which consumers to serve, which consumers to sell to, right? If there's a consumer whose V is very low, then the monopolist may not for, find it worthwhile to serve that customer. So the monopolist problem really boils down to coming up with a cutoff, a threshold V star, right? that I'm going to sell to people whose willingness to pay is V star or more. Those who are less than that, uh, I'll say, you know, sorry, uh, I can't sell to you. So the monopolist's profit function is given by this, right, which is maximizing. So remember that anybody who the monopolist sells to, he sells at their own V, okay? So the total revenue of the monopolist is the sum of all the Vs or the integral of all the Vs, starting from the cutoff V star to all the higher values, right? So this is kind of the revenue of the monopolist. And from that, you have to subtract the cost. What is the cost? Uh, F of V star are the number of, are the, are the measure of consumers who are left out. If, you have, if the monopolist has set a threshold at V star, uh, the F of V star is the size of people uh, who will be not sold to. So one minus F of V star, one remember is the total size of consumers in this little model. So one minus F of V star is the fraction or the size of consumers to whom the monopolist chooses to sell. And since all of them buy just one unit, uh, this is also the number of units that the monopolist has to manufacture. And you plug that into the cost function that gives you the total cost of serving all these people above V star, right? So everybody follows what the, uh, profit function is and where it comes from. Uh, sir, can you please explain the last part again? Why is it one minus F of V star? So if, if the monopolist decides to sell to everyone whose uh, willingness to pay is V star or above, then people whose willingness to pay is below V star are, are not sold to, okay? So what is the measure of people of that sort in that group who, who don't receive the good? Uh, that is F of V star by definition, right? So you subtract that from, from one, that's the measure of consumers to whom the monopolist has decided to sell when he set a threshold at V star. Right? Yes, I got it, yeah. And that's what you uh, throw inside the cost function. So when we are taking out the revenue, why are we multiplying with small F V? That's a density function, right? If you think of it as not a continuous distribution but several discrete values, then each V will be multiplied by its probability, not the cumulative probability, but by its own in individual probability, right? What is the probability or frequency or measure of people who have exactly that V, okay? And so, so essentially this first term, the revenue is, is nothing but the conditional expectation of V, if you will, right? Uh, yes, sir. Given that V is above V star, what is its expected value? Um, okay, 
So the choice variable is V star, the cutoff or the threshold. Um, so you have to differentiate, you have to set the derivative with respect to V star equal to zero, right? And V star notice, remember, uh, crops up here as the limit of an integral, yes? Now, you guys remember Leibniz rule of taking derivatives with respect to limits of integrals? Yes. Right, so if I'm taking the derivative with respect to the lower limit, I basically take the function which is uh, being integrated and plug in that value V star inside that function with a negative sign, right? And if I were taking derivatives with respect to the upper integral, I would take the function, plug in that value with a positive sign. The intuition of that Leibniz rule is very simple. I, I, I let me not make a digression on that. I will be happy to explain, uh, but you should remember from your undergraduate uh, calculus lessons. Uh, so this is the derivative, okay? Um, I'll, I'll give you the economic intuition of the of the result that we are arriving at. Yeah. So when you apply Leib Leibniz rule, you get this expression of the derivative and that is set equal to zero. Um, and when you simplify, you get this condition that V star is basically at the point where uh, V star is equal to marginal cost, right? Um, now, if this was a competitive market, uh, what would be the outcome? Again, in a competitive market, the outcome can be characterized by who is the last consumer who's served by this market, right? People with very low V won't be served by the market because the market price will be above their V and they'll choose not to buy. So if we make it a competitive market, where, where will the price settle? What will be the market clearing price? And I claim that the market clearing price will be exactly this V star, right? V star is like a price. <clears throat> v star is like a price. Um, it's the price that the last consumer, the marginal consumer is willing to pay. And so essentially this equation that we arrived at is nothing but the price equals marginal cost rule. Let me simplify it even further, right? The intuition is very easy to understand. When you have perfect price discrimination like this, okay? Uh, meaning that every consumer is charged right up to his willingness to pay. So what will be consumer surplus on, in that situation? Zero. 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 Just zero, right? So that means entire, whatever the monopolist chooses, whatever, wherever he sets V star, whatever is the size of the market he, he chooses to serve, um, social surplus will consist of entirely producer surplus of profits. Consumer surplus will always be zero, right? So producer surplus becomes synonymous with social surplus. So whatever maximizes pro, uh, producer surplus or profits ends up maximizing social surplus. The quantity which will maximize social surplus will also maximize the profits of the monopolist under perfect price discrimination. There's no wedge, there's no difference between the two. When we had this cruder pricing instrument in the first part of today's lecture, right? Where the monopolist couldn't take out entire consumer surplus because they had to charge a single price. They couldn't charge different prices to different people. There, some amount of consumer surplus was left on the table by the monopolist. And that's why there was a divergence between social surplus and profits. And that's why we had the inefficiency of monopoly, et cetera, et cetera. But once we allow for perfect price discrimination, that is no longer true because all consumer surplus has been uh, sucked out of the system of the market. And, and so the, it is in the interest of the monopolist to choose the efficient quantity, right? So how are we interpreting from the math that all the consumer surplus has been sucked out? 
oh, that's right off the bat, right? So what did we say? We, are, we made a very strong assumption. Of course, you can criticize it for unrealism and other things, but we are looking at a theoretical benchmark, right? In this theoretical benchmark, somehow the monopolist is a mind reader. So the monopolist, for every buyer, the monopolist knows the exact value of V, meaning how what's the maximum he's willing to pay. So you're willing okay, to pay sir. up to, right? So, okay, sir. So we took V as the price that it is selling at. I thought, yes. sir, the, 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 the FOC was reinforcing that idea. No, 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 no. It, it came even before that, right? Okay. That, uh, okay. Each person is charged their individual V. And V is different for different people. So the prices are different for different people. And, and everybody is uh, priced up to the point where they are indifferent between buying and not buying. Yes, sir, got it. Thank you, sir. Yeah. So, so, so can you please explain the interpretational difference between small FV and capital FV? Capital FV in, in, the, in, in terms of, let's say, statistics, right? Uh, capital FV is like the distribution function and small FV is the density function. So, so capital FV represents the total number of consumers who are ready to uh, like buy the good at B star. That's right, right? Okay. So, who are not ready to buy the good at V star, right? So total number of consumers whose V is V star or less, whereas small FV is the total number of consumers whose, uh, whose uh, valuation is exactly equal to the argument of the function. Okay, so got it. Right. This is the so cumulative. It's a proportion. Thing. Yeah. So it's a proportion, proportion of consumers. Right. So can you please go over this um, reason for the absence of inefficiency once again? The 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 broad intuition beyond the maths, right? Yes, sir. Yes, it's very simple. If you allow for perfect price discrimination, then consumer surplus disappears. The monop whatever the monopolist, let's say, plucks a number out of the hat, then I'll I want to serve half the consumers. Suppose maybe half this is not you know optimal for him, maybe half is not what a competitive market would have served. Suppose he chooses half. All right. So he prices it so that half the people are willing to buy at that price and half the people are not. Right now, under perfect price discrimination, what does he do? He doesn't charge a single price among the uh, half half the market that he, he has decided he'll serve. Right, the, the top half of the market. To each person, he goes, looks at their V, and charges them their own V. So each person is willing to pay up to V. That's the V is the value of the product to them. And that's also the price they have to pay. So each person gets a zero consumer surplus. So the total consumer surplus is zero, right? And so, so whatever social surplus is generated when half the market is served, um, all of it goes into the monopolist's profit, into the monopolist's profit, uh, pocket, right? Consumer surplus is zero. Social surplus from any quantity choice is, is all profits. And so maximizing profits becomes maximizing social surplus. Right? Okay, let me move ahead. If you're still scratching your head a little bit, I'll be happy to kind of revisit and explain again. I, I get it, sir. Thank you. Okay. All right. Um, now, uh, there's another kind of... Um, um, price discrimination, which is not across consumers, but across different units that the same consumer might buy, right? So now let's not think of discrete choice things like, you know, unit demand models, like, you know, a washing machine or a car. Uh, let's think of, you know, uh, bread or, or ice cream, right? Where the same person uh, not just decides whether to buy it or not, but how much to buy. And if it's more expensive, maybe you'll buy less. Um, in this situation, uh, in order to soak up all the consumer surplus, what the monopolist has to do is to charge different prices for different units, not just from different prices from different customers, but different prices for different units that the same person buys. 
Yeah. Or in other words, it has to engage in some sort of non-linear pricing formula, not a flat pricing uh, offer. Uh, and there are many examples of that, right? Our electricity pricing, for example, is volume dependent, that you have a certain price up to a point, after that, the price climbs. Often you have the opposite. You have uh, sort of buy one, get one free, or buy two, get one free, or buy three and get the fourth at 50% off. These are all examples of volume dependent pricing, right? Uh, so we can think of that, and if we push it to the limit, then it becomes second degree price discrimination. The perfect form of both volume dependent nonlinear pricing is uh, what is called second degree price discrimination. Um, and what they call third degree price discrimination is really a cruder form of first degree price discrimination, where instead of fine tuning and customizing the price to each individual consumer, right? Consumers are maybe broken up into sort of crude broad segments. Within each segment, there may be some heterogeneity, but there's an average difference across the segments. So the Indian market for textbooks versus the American market for textbooks was an example of that sort. That's, a, that's, a, that's an example where um, they are not charging different prices for each buyer, but they're charging different prices for segments of buyers, right? And thereby they're trying to approximate first degree price discrimination. Anyway, these are all terms. Uh, nothing much is uh, learned from just terminology. Let's talk about second degree price discrimination. So single consumer, um, demands are variable. It's not just zero one. Um, and let's say this, this is the demand curve of that single consumer, right? Uh, so we are going to focus on that. Now, if there's flat pricing or constant unit prices, uh, and that's what the monopolist is restricted to, then let's say this is PM is the monopoly price and QM is the monopoly quantity, right? This is, this is the simple uh, monopolist. Now, suppose the monopolist can start fiddling around with this and suppose the monopolist can do something like this. Uh, Okay, under this simple flat pricing rule, you know, the blue is the consumer surplus, the, the orange is the profits. For the purpose of this picture, let's say the costs are zero, right? We can easily throw in a marginal cost curve here and, and you know, the picture will be modified there. Um, now, suppose the monopolist can start creating slabs so the monopolist can say up to Q1, I'll charge you a price of P1. And if you buy more than Q1, then for those extra units, I'll charge you a lower price PM. All right. Uh, so let's take this sort of simple two part kind of pricing, right? Then what is consumer surplus? Can somebody identify what the, on the picture? So what the, the tiny the triangle on the top. Top and the side one also, because if, Right. Oh, yeah, it's the time. Um, yeah, these two triangles, right? So initially the big triangle was the consumer surplus and now what has happened is that uh, through this little trick, the monopolist has eaten into some of the consumer surplus, right? This, this rectangle is the encroachment of profits into consumer surplus, right? But now you can expand on this. Suppose there are three slabs created up to q1 the price is p1 between q1 and q2 the price unit price is p2 and beyond q2 the unit price is pm and then uh, if we draw the picture uh, there's there's more of an encroachment into the consumer surplus area and now if you push it to the limit if you let the you know tiny tiny slabs and the price is kind of continuously uh, keeps varying and in the limit you can even think of a pricing formula which varies continuously with the quantity purchased in a way so that it grazes the demand curve itself, right? And when that pricing formula is adopted, then what happens is all of the consumer surplus goes away and, and feeds into profit, yes. So using this trick, volume dependent pricing and if the seller knows the exact position of the demand curve of the buyer, the seller can essentially mop up all the consumer surplus, 
whatever quantity it chooses to produce, the consumer surplus that might have been generated is, is entirely uh, you know, captured through this sort of pricing formula. Now, if that happens, then uh, what would be the optimal quantity choice of the monopolist? It won't be that old monopoly quantity. It will be, again, the competitive output level. Why is that? Again, the same logic that uh, through this nonlinear pricing, if you can capture all the consumer surplus, then profits become synonymous with social surplus. And maximizing profits basically becomes uh, maximizing social surplus as far as the quantity choice goes. Yes. So this is an important point that price discrimination eliminates the deadweight loss of monopoly. The monopolist will now choose the socially efficient level of output. Yes. So inefficiency goes away. Of course, in terms of distribution, it becomes even worse for consumers. Right. And that is, that is another reminder to you not to be too carried away by this term efficiency. What's happening here, if you think of you know, the seller as a very rich, privileged guy, or the shareholders of the company selling it are, are very rich people, and the buyers are sort of poor people, and if your sympathies are with them, then uh, allowing for price discrimination would increase efficiency. But that doesn't mean that, that it's a very happy outcome because, because a lot of poor people are now uh, put in more, under more stress. Um, they don't have a drop of surplus from the market. Yes. So the twin problems of monopoly has to be conceived of very differently, that there's a distributive aspect of monopoly, and then there's an inefficiency angle of monopoly, and the inefficiency angle would actually go away if you allow for more sophisticated pricing instruments to the monopolist, if that's possible. But then the distributive aspect gets worse. Uh, so, sir, in this case, again, the competition equilibrium will come in place. Yes, the quantity will be what a competitive market would have produced. The yeah. difference is that the competitive market would have priced all units of the good at the same flat thing, right? So it'll, it, the quantity yes, market would have left a lot of consumer surplus, this whole triangle. Uh, but the monopolist doesn't leave any of that. Sir? So Yes. But isn't it the case of first degree price discrimination only because for this also the producer needs to know the reservation price of the consumer, yes. of every consumer. But the difference is that in the first degree price discrimination, what we were calling first degree price discrimination, we were looking at the aspect that different prices are charged to different people. Here, different prices are charged to the same person for the successive units that, that, that consumer buys. It's just the term, you know, I mean, <laughs> but it, the, there's a meaningful difference between, between the two. That's why first degree versus second degree. So, yeah. so in like, you know, in company like Geo, so mm -hmm. they have their, uh, like, you know, the monthly package and the price of the monthly package or the price of three month package, data package, they, they sell it on a different, different prices. So is yeah. that the same thing like a second degree price discrimination, wherein the quantities are... Uh, like price differently for different quantities. Like. Yes, often if you look at the pricing kind of formula, they are some crude versions. I mean, both the first degree and second degree price discrimination that we talked about are kind of theoretically idealized platonic forms of price discrimination that, you know, this is sort of the price discrimination put to its idealized extreme. Uh, often companies engage in some cruder, more approximate version of that. So they will do perhaps something like, you know, this sort of slab based, uh, where's the picture? Uh, you know, as, as when I was building up towards this point, uh, this kind of slab based pricing example that I was showing you, that's what they do. Because in practice, you know, I mean, to, you don't want the pricing to be too complicated. Uh, so, so, uh, Often you will see that, you know, if you buy smaller volume, the, your unit price is higher and there's basically volume discounts. That if you buy more, the unit price, they price it in a way that your unit price is lower, right? They have things like, you know, multi-packs. 
of various products. Um, you buy, I don't know, razor blades, you buy sort of a six pack of uh, soda or something and, and it's priced lower. That's essentially something like this, right? Um, airlines have their frequent flyer programs, which, which basically say makes, uh, if you fly more times, you get it cheaper. The, the extra flights, the marginal flights that you take uh, get cheaper if you've flown a lot. And that's kind of a clever way of trying to do something like this. Okay, sir. Got it. Thank you, sir. Yeah. Excuse me, sir. Yeah. Sir, is there any logic of naming second degree price discrimination? I didn't, you know, let me let me tell you one thing. <laughs> Definitions are not important, okay? Definitions are important so that we are speaking a common language. Now, the, the term we are using may, you may not like the term, doesn't matter. As long as we are clear what we are referring to, right? As I said, I was myself a little uh, sarcastic about these terms, first degree, second degree, uh, sounds like torture rather than price discrimination, third degree torture. Just like, just like sir, in mathematics, first order differentiation, second order differentiation, yes. that's so high connecting. Who, who, yes, but who cares? Right? I can call it uh, Rumpelstiltskin instead of second degree price discrimination, right? Uh, let's decide on a term, and what is important is the concept, the, the logic, uh, the policy implications. Uh, those are the things that we want to understand and take away, right? Uh, okay, sir. These terms come from old textbooks, so whatever they call it, let them call it. Okay, sir. Okay, sir. Yeah. Um, sir, uh, sir can, uh, uh, can we go ahead? So uh, sir, in the previous diagram, yeah. Uh, sir, why do we say that the quantity is that of perfect competition? Uh, since uh, the cost, marginal cost here is zero. So yes. won't the quantity go up all the way till the end? Yes. So, so I made the argument in two steps, right? If the monopolist can only do flat pricing, there's some optimal price PM and optimal quantity QM, right? First, I made the argument that Suppose the monopolist doesn't want to change that quantity, suppose, right? Or chooses some quantity at random. For whatever quantity it has chosen, it can essentially soak up all the consumer surplus through this sort of uh, pricing, nonlinear pricing, right? And now the monopolist has to think, okay, should I stick to that old QM when, when that I was choosing when I was doing flat pricing or should I increase or decrease it? And that second part of the question, the answer to that is that no, now he should expand it all the way. You know, if the cost is zero, if the marginal cost is grazing the axis, then he should take it all the way to this corner point. He should produce that much because he can then capture the entire triangle uh, through this sort of nonlinear pricing rule. And if he has some positive marginal cost, he will take it up to that point where the demand curve intersects that marginal cost curve because uh, that maximizes social surplus and he, by using this trick, he can capture the entire social surplus and squeeze consumer surplus down to zero. So the picture as I have drawn it only refers to the first part of the argument, right? In this picture, I'm not trying to determine what the quantity is. I'm trying to make the point that all of consumer surplus can be taken away. Okay, okay, all right, sir. Uh, so I was asking, is it possible that in, in a monopsonist, uh, there is a price discrimination or Let's say wage discrimination is there. Yes, it's possible, right? Monopsony is is basically. I think there's a problem in the problem set where I give you a problem to work out on monopsony. Monopsony is where there's one buyer and many sellers, and the analysis is mirror image. Yes. So so their price discrimination would be yeah, as you said, you know, if it's a labor market and there's a single employer like you know the Chinese government or something, uh, and they knew the reservation wages of different workers, then they'll pay different wages according to uh, reservation wages. Yeah, I mean, uh, the, the, the concepts and the analysis and the conclusions are exactly the same for monopsony. Um, sir, in the first degree uh, price discrimination, we assume that there's either one quantity or zero quantity, right? 
so that doesn't in a way that doesn't depend on the quantity but the second order uh, second degree price discrimination depends on the quantity that the consumer is buying yes okay so you can combine the two you can think that different consumers have different demand curves right and you combine price discrimination across people and across units by basically saying for each consumer they will adopt this a pricing formula which basically grazes that consumer's demand curve okay sir yeah so also uh, like till now we have only talked about homogeneous products right i mean there is no differentiation in the uh, yeah quality of products or anything right okay yeah i can't talk about that because to understand that we'll need game theory and my mandate uh, does not include game theory you will you will talk about product differentiation etc cetera, etc cetera, when you study oligopoly and go beyond that in in the second micro course next next time okay so i wish i was teaching it because it's much more fun and exciting but i can excuse me sir yeah in, in first degree price dis discrimination consumer is only bound to buy only one units or more than that as i just said it i don't have to assume it i i i kept i showed you a very simple model with unit demand just to make the point um, right you okay. can combine what you saw in that model versus this second degree price discrimination you combine the two and the same point will go through that if if the monopolist can uh, perfectly discriminate across consumers and within consumers for different units then he can take away all consumer surplus and when he it is possible for him to do that all the inefficiency will go away because profit maximization becomes synonymous with surplus social surplus maximization that point is very very general if you think about it and it's very simple yes okay, okay. um all right now now uh, you, you have to i have to ask for your indulgence for another Five or six minutes, right? I just want to finish this. And, um, um, okay, here's some examples. I took screenshots from various websites. Here's one from the Metropolitan Museum of Art in New York, which is one of the world's greatest museums. So, if you go to New York, you, this is this should be towards the top of your list to visit. It has uh, um, examples from the medieval masters all the way down to 20th century masters, Picasso and all. Anyway, um, if you look at it, this is a daily price ticket. If you go for a day and one visit, you have to pay for adults $25. Now, already on this, uh, here you see that there's some crude attempt at price discrimination, right? Senior citizens, um, lower price, students even lower price. Um, and you see this sort of, you know, senior citizen discounts, student discounts, even from out and out commercial vendors. Yes. Now, on the face of it, uh, if you ask their PR person, you know, why are you charging these different prices? They will say, oh, we are, we care about um, our senior citizens, our students. Uh, we are doing it out of the goodness of our heart. But there's a profit motive to keep uh, prices different for different identifiable and verifiably different uh, market segments, right? You can verify student status by asking for IDs. And you know that students have less money and they're more price sensitive. So it's in the interest of profits to, to price like this. Anyway, uh, so this is the general adult general admission, right? Without uh, student or senior discounts. Uh, now, if you look at their website, uh, this is I. Like, you know, I made this long time back. I'm pretty sure if you go back today, you will find a similar structure. They also have a membership subscription, annual subscription, which is $70, right? So if you are planning to visit it three or more times a year, then of course you get a, you know, uh, if you buy a ticket each time it's $75. And if you get the subscription, then already uh, the subscription cost is, is made up if you um, if you plan to go uh, at least three times yes 
So this kind of subscription of a membership offer is an example of a two-part pricing. And I think in the last lecture, somebody mentioned Walter Oy, and Walter Oy wrote one of the first papers, um, which is two-part pricing. And the general approach there is that uh, there's a fixed charge to become a customer, a client, to earn the privilege of buying anything at all. And then you pay a per unit price for every successive unit you buy. So if you become a member of a club, for example, right, you pay an annual membership fee. And then every time you use the club, you know, the swimming pool, you eat at the restaurant, then you pay a per use charge there, which can sometimes be zero, but sometimes can be positive. Um, so this is an example of two part pricing, right, a fixed fee plus a part per unit cost. And one of the things we, that Walter Roy pointed out um, is that uh, you don't have to do very complicated nonlinear pricing. You can achieve the same result as uh, second degree price discrimination uh, through a two part tariff scheme. Um, so to, to show that, let me uh, show that. So suppose each consumer has this quasi-linear utility function, which is you know, what we started with. Again, the point is more general. And the monopolist can charge an entry fee, F. Right? If you want any positive quantity, you have to first pay this gate fee, entry fee, whatever you want to call it. And then there's a price per unit, P, and that's flat. Once you pay the entry fee, every unit you consume, you pay another price, P. And using only these two instruments and this kind of very simple pricing formula, in principle, all the consumer surplus can again be mopped up, right? And that leads to the same point, I'm reiterating it. Uh, anytime you give the monopolist sufficiently powerful pricing instruments so that he can extract all the consumer surplus, inefficiency of monopoly will go away. Efficiency will be restored for the reason that I've been harping on. That, that once consumer surplus can be driven down to zero, uh, social surplus just becomes equal to profits. And so profit maximization leads to, to efficiency. Um, so let's see why, why that is the case. And, and it's pretty simple. Um, so fix an F and a P, all right? And suppose the consumer has agreed to pay the F. And now the consumer has entered the club the amusement park, the whatever, what have you. Um, if it's a streaming service, for example, right? These days we are all looking at Net Netflix and Amazon Prime. Again, you have a monthly subscription fee, and then each movie you watch, you know, some of them are free. Sometimes you can have a pay per view rate, which is positive, um, but you have to pay that upfront fee. Right. So suppose the consumer has paid the fee, agreed to pay the fee, and now it becomes a sunk cost once he has come in. And now the, he faces a price P per unit, and so he'll maximize his uh, overall utility. Uh, this is the maximization problem, and uh, um, this is our demand curve, right? Now, there's one problem that the monopolist has to be aware of, which is one step back, which is that, you know, if he charges too high a fee, then people may not pay that in the first place, right? So how much quantity they'll consume becomes irrelevant because they found the F to be forbiddingly high, right? So the monopolist has to make sure that this inequality is satisfied. What is this inequality? If the consumer pays the entry fee, F, and then comes in and uh, consumes the optimal quantity, right, which is given by Q of P, the demand function. Uh, this is the net utility of the consumer, and that should be greater than Y. Why is that? Because if the consumer stays away from this uh, deal, this offer, then his total utility is going to be Y. Yeah, phi of zero is zero, and so all the utility will come from the linear part where all the income will be uh, spent. Um, now, so this is the monopolist problem. This is the monopolist profit. Total revenue from the sales, 
plus the fixed fee minus the cost of providing this quantity, right? That will be demanded subject to what may be called the participation constraint that you don't want to send the consumer away even before he becomes a subscriber by charging too high a fee, right? Now, if you look at it for a moment, so the monopolist is choosing F and P to maximize, to solve this maximizing problem. Now, whatever P the monopolist charges, whatever per unit price that the monopolist charges, whatever uh, the club decides should be the, um, uh, should, should be the price of a meal at the restaurant, right? Uh, fix any P, it is always profitable to keep increasing the F so that, um, so that this equality is satisfied, yeah? Uh, so, so that this constraint is satisfied with equality. Uh, somebody scribble something, please erase that. Um, so, so the optimum value of F will make the participation constraint binding, right? Now, once you understand that, you can do a replacement. Instead of F in the objective function, you can uh, replace whatever comes from this equality. And when you, when you solve when you do that substitution, essentially everything cancels out except the P times Q term and the cost term, right? So this is what uh, the, the seller will maximize by choosing P appropriately. Now, if you look closely at this, this is nothing but social surplus. This is the value created for consumers and this is the cost of production. So this difference is the social surplus. And so the monopolist's problem again reduces to social surplus maximization when he can exercise this two-part tariff instrument. Uh, essentially, uh, the logic is very, very simple. You know, uh, Let me just very quickly draw a picture to make that clear and then I'll stop. Um, So you have um, you have a consumer, you have a demand curve. Uh, let's say there's some marginal cost, which is yeah, let's say it's constant, doesn't have to be. Um, now, if, uh, if our monopolist charges a price P higher than the marginal cost, then what is his profit? Well, first of all, on all the sales, uh, he makes a profit of this amount. Now, if he didn't charge any entry fee, there would be this triangle would be the consumer surplus. So he can charge an entry fee, which is all the way up to this triangle, right? So he can add that to his profits. But notice that he misses out on this little triangle, right? So a better policy for him would be to charge a price uh, which is lower, which is actually exactly equal to the marginal cost. And then this amount of consumer surplus is created, but he can immediately take it all in his pocket by charging an appropriate entry fee, right? Which is equal to the size of this triangle. So his instrument for profit generation would be an upfront fee, not uh, a per unit price later. So the per unit price uh, will be very reasonable. It will be the co at the competitive level uh, where the really the monopolist sort of puts in the squeeze is, is a very high subscription fee, entry fee. So again, you see that uh, inefficiency disappears, but uh, consumers really lose out a lot.
questions? Uh, so, yeah. So, this is again a case of one consumer, right? We have one consumer and then we are extracting all of their surplus. Yes. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Uh, again, these are idealized cases, right? Um, if if the monopolist knew the demand curve of each and every consumer, they can of course you know customize their pricing to that consumer and do accordingly. So they'll probably charge. Uh, uh, uh. So if they have a constant marginal cost, what we should see under perfect price discrimination across consumers and within consumers is that they will charge everyone the same unit price, which will be equal to their marginal cost. They may charge us different entry fees. If they can see our demand curves, they'll calculate that triangle area for each of us and will charge us different uh, entry fees. Right. In practice, of course, they can't do that. But, but they may have, you know, again, they can do crude approximations of like that. So this uh, example, which I showed you, which is a museum, uh, they are offering um, um, annual memberships. Yes, but you can, you can see, or you can conceive, and sometimes you often see them, even the membership rates are, are differentiated for, there can be a student rate, there can be a, um, there can be a senior citizen rate and so on. Right. Yes, sir. Yeah. Uh, so, could you please go back to the slides? Yes. So, so in the surplus sense, everything boils boil down to equity versus efficiency. I mean, efficiency is there, but equity is not. I mean. Yeah. Okay. yeah. Efficiency improves, but there's more of a gap between the seller and the buyer, more inequality between them. I mean, if you're sympathetic to the seller, this is not to say that, you know, we should always side with consumers. You know, if you think of uh, people selling Bhelpuri Bel to, uh, to people in Bandra in Bombay, Mumbai, <laughs> maybe your sympathies will be with the with the seller rather than the buyer, right? But yeah, I mean, relatively speaking, there's there's more inequality between the seller and the buyer. So I think that optimum by the constraint has to be binding. Because if the constraint isn't binding, okay. So the monopolist is trying to maximize profits. Suppose it has chosen a P and an F, and we find that this inequality is great, okay? What could be a possible recommendation if you're hired as a consultant? You could say that, you know, you, you, we, even without bothering about adjusting fee, you could say that, look, you're, you're, you can increase your fixed fee. And since the inequality is strict, if you increase it by small amounts, it will continue to hold this, this inequality. And so the consumer won't go away and your profits will increase. Right, so so choose any P, maybe the optimum P, maybe the not optimum P. The right F to choose is such that, that this participation constraint just about binds, that this holds with equality. Otherwise it won't be profit maximizing. Okay, sir. Yeah. Oh, so, hmm. can you please go back to the previous slide? Yeah. Um. Yeah, yeah, that's one. Yes, sir. Let me just annotate uh, for a second. So what's this and how do we interpret this? See, if you write down the first order condition here, right, what will, if, uh, you're maximizing with respect to Q. So the first order condition will really be phi prime of Q equals P, right? Yeah. Yes. So now, if you want to solve for Q, we have to invert the apply the inverse function of phi prime uh, to P. So, so just write down phi prime of Q equals P, and this is just this is just sort of you know. Uh, yeah. Quantity yeah. expressed as a function of P rather than the other way around. Yeah. 
Okay, and uh, this is assuming that this function, this um, phi q function, uh, this is a one one function, right? One one and a yeah. one two function. Yeah. Okay. And we can make some mild assumptions which will guarantee that. So, for example, if phi is strictly concave, it will be a monotonic function, right? So it's one to one and invertible. Yes, sir. Got it. Thank you so much. Yeah. So. Yeah. So why do we have a M here, over here, and a Y uh, in the optimization uh, problem that we are using? Why are we using it interchangeably? Which two things interchangeably? Just a second. M. Yes, a uh, M there and a Y over there. So why have we replaced okay. both of them? So this is the previous notation. I, I, I didn't spell it out. So Y is the income of this consumer and M is the money spent on everything else. Right? So why do I have a Y here? So if the consumer doesn't buy this product, is unwilling to pay this entry fee, then, then M becomes equal to Y. Yes? is spending all q is zero so this part becomes zero and all the money is free to spend on other things so that's why in that case m equal to y when when he uh when he chooses not to subscribe or pay the entry fee now when he chooses to pay the entry fee and uh, there um uh, what is the value of m m is his income minus whatever he has spent on this code which is the entry fee and the P times Q, right? So in, in that situation, Y minus F minus P times Q is M. It's the money spent on other goods. Okay, sir. okay, good. All right. So, so um, yes. in the diagram you have explained where we have uh, taken the marginal cost, the last uh, one. Could you please go there? Um, I don't know where earlier. At the end, sir, where you have uh, showed us the marginal cost and the monopoly price. You have taken a board for that. You have oh, oh the... right. okay, yeah, okay, this one. Yeah, so if uh, the monopoly, if the pr monopoly price is charged, which is not equal to marginal cost. Hmm. then uh, this lower uh, small triangle is lost for the monopoly yeah is it and sir will it that uh, be a dead weight loss it will also be a dead weight loss uh, but it will also be a loss of profits again profits end up being the entire social surplus because all consumer surplus is taken away through the f through the fixed fee right so yes if the monopolist makes a mistake, it won't be the optimal thing for him to do. But if the monopolist makes a mistake and charges a price higher than marginal cost, and then charges this triangle as F, then this this triangle, uh, this thing, is both a dead waste loss for society as well as lost profits for the monopolist. All right, sir. Thank you. So as per this diagram, monopolist should charge. Equal to marginal cost. Yes, it's optimal for him to charge marginal cost, right? He's a very okay. nice guy to people who become a member of the club. Once they become member, they are given very generous rates, not a penny above cost. Uh, where the monopolist really puts in the squeeze and, and extracts a lot from the clients is at the beginning through the uh, entry fee, through the subscription fee. Sir? Yes. Here the small green triangle represents the entry fee or the whole red triangle. Well, it depends on which P he has chosen, right? So if he uh, chooses, if he uh, chooses the wrong P, so this is his cost. And by mistake, he chooses 
a price per unit price, which is above cost, there the entry fee that he can charge is this triangle in this case, right? But if he gets it right, um, so his marginal cost and he chooses a price which is equal to his marginal cost, right? Then he can charge an entry fee which is bigger, which is this larger triangle. Right? And in this situation, the entry fee is not only bigger than in this situation, it is so much bigger that in the first case, this was his F, right? But he was making some profits on the margin because he's charging more than cost. So this green area was also adding to his profits. Now, when he lowers the price, he loses out on this green stuff, right? But the entry fee is so much bigger that it not only compensates for this green area, but it also picks up this little triangle which he was not getting previously. Right? So here, the, the, fixed, the highest fixed fee that he can charge depends on uh, what the unit price he has chosen. And it's bigger in this case than in the previous case. Right? Yes, sir. Thank you. Yeah. All right. Sir, can we buyer, can, sir, can buyer alter their price policy? Uh, say that again. So can buyers uh, alter their price policy? Buyers? Yes, sir. No, we're, we're talking about monopolists. So the idea is that the monopolist sort of take makes a take it or leave it price offer. The monopolist announces a price, uh, a two-part tariff, and the buyers can either say yes or no. The buyers don't have much market power. That's the way we have framed the problem. Okay, sir. Okay, guys, it's, it's quite late. So I will end the session here and uh, we'll have, uh, you know, I'll have the contact hours tomorrow from uh, one o'clock, right? So um, anybody who wants to ask questions, clear some doubts, then uh, please join in this Zoom room at uh, one o'clock tomorrow, yeah? Okay. See you tomorrow. Bye. Thank you, sir. 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 Thank you, sir.